Surrounded by some of the world's highest peaks, the Daima district in northern Pakistan is not easy to reach. Isolated for generations, the tribal people here have always been religious, conservative and suspicious of outsiders. Until recently there was little education, women could not earn their own income and people were open to extremist ideas. Now all that has changed. Before, people from this area would go and train in different areas of Pakistan in the name of waging jihad to protect Islam. After the projects, a change came on the people and they stopped going. This project that caused such a change in people's attitudes was initiated by the UN's International Fund for Agricultural Development, or IFAD. Its aim was to reduce poverty and it was the first ever development project in the area. But for the tribal people here, what the project proposed was initially hard to accept. At first they said women's organizations had to be formed, but the social attitudes in this area didn't allow women to gather or be mobilized. The project also brought a credit system with loans. But according to the people's perception here, those loans were un-Islamic. This was viewed as a threat to their religion and culture. The resistance was fierce. It came to a point that bombs went off, vehicles were fired at. I was there myself in Darel. The vehicles were stopped, tires were burst, glass was blown out. We were only saved when people from the nearby village came to rescue us. The religious scholars in the area were deeply divided. It took four years before they agreed that the project activities were not against Islam. After this, the communities embraced the project and became actively involved in the decision-making. A road was built, giving them access to markets, schools and health facilities. Clean water was channeled to their houses. The introduction of new crops and livestock meant people could feed themselves and increase their incomes. Despite the initial resistance, 140 women's organizations were formed, and for the first time, these women generated and managed their own income. With development came an awareness. Our minds were changed psychologically and mentally. Before the project, this area had a literacy rate of 9%, with virtually no female schooling. For people like sheep farmer Abdul Shakur, the project made education accessible, affordable, and most importantly, desirable. Look at me and those who came before me. We are all illiterate, but now all our children are educated. Before we only lived our lives in this small area, but now we know this is a very big world. And as the people began to view the world in a different way, development, education and peaceful living became a priority, and there was a shift away from extremist thinking. The real test of this change in attitude came in 2008, when locals say a group of extremists schooled in Taliban teachings tried to infiltrate the area. This Islamic scholar says that before the project, the extremists would have been welcomed here. We sent these people back because our future development was at stake. We want our development in education, in money and trade. We want development of our people. This is only possible when there is peace. Now this community no longer relies on the project to fulfill its needs. They've recently pooled their own money to generate electricity. And at a time when fundamentalism threatens world stability, they are proof that when people are exposed to a bigger world, attitudes can change. For Hungry Planet, I'm Joanne Leverton. On October 31st, the world's population reached 7 billion. By 2050, it will top 9 billion. How many will go hungry? That depends on us. The 500 million small farms in the developing world need our support. They grow up to 80% of food consumed in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. But these small farmers are struggling, and many give up to head to the cities. To keep farming, they need access to land, water and finance. And they need roads to take their products to market. 
Investing in them today will go a long way to feeding us all tomorrow. The pastures of the Mongolian steppe provide the fodder for a nomadic livelihood that remains a major force in the national economy. Yet there are also sizable forests, occupying 12% of Mongolia's territory. Less visible, but no less vital to the survival of Mongolia's people and wildlife. Oyentugs is on one of her regular missions to monitor and protect these forests. She is a forest user group ranger on the lookout for illegal cutting of trees or forest fires. Her role is part of a pilot project that is fundamentally changing how Mongolians interact with their forests. Our attitude toward the forest has changed. Now we use it properly and treat it like our own. As Mongolia's economy has expanded, its forests have been shrinking. Greater demand for timber, human-sparked fires, mining, and overstocking of cattle have taken a toll on the nation's tree cover. But things are now improving through the efforts of people like Bachagal. He is the chairman of his local forest user group, a body of ordinary citizens who oversee the community's woodland resources. We have seen that things were going wrong when trees were logged illegally and streams and rivers started to dry up. So the local people wanted to establish a forest user group. It's been three years since then. They are one of 15 pilot groups that have been established in five provinces across Mongolia. The first phase of a novel program supported by the FAO with funding from the government of the Netherlands. The participatory forest management program enables peoples whose lives are directly connected to forests to use and manage them. User group members receive training on forest assessment, mapping, management planning, fire prevention and marketing of forest products. They then develop their own plan to put into action. Protection efforts are showing signs of success. In project areas, illegal logging has essentially ceased and herders feel they are no longer dependent on outside forces to protect their environment and their livelihoods. Before we didn't have that feeling, but when we were faced with the crisis, our attitude changed. If a stranger's vehicle entered the forest, we reported the information. That means we're taking full responsibility to protect the forest. Since we have owned the forest, everyone has become concerned about it. The pilot phase is now ending, and the next step will be to scale up the project nationwide, giving more Mongolians a stake in the future of their forests. For Hungry Planet, I'm Steve Nettleton. Dark clouds of the seasonal goo rains may be on the horizon earlier than expected, but for so many, it's already too late. Like other pastoralists in Somalia, life for Nadifa's family has changed beyond recognition over the past few months. Life was beautiful. We had good livestock and good rains. But gradually, the rainfall situation deteriorated and our living conditions therefore also deteriorated. The family once had a thriving business, selling milk and meat from their hundreds of goats, with pack camels to support their nomadic existence. 
but the drought resulted in the death of all but 10 of their goats and for now their way of life. We could not continue living in the rural areas when the livestock had reduced and the pack camels we were using as transport died. And that's why we came to this settlement. <laughs> the place they have come to is Dahol, a village in the Muduk region of central Somalia. Here, they and others like them have found help. WFP has been providing food to keep families going during this devastating drought. The families in need have already been registered. And at the distribution site, they are told the amount and type of food they will receive. Each ration is to last for one month. This type of food assistance is designed to be a temporary measure and will safeguard people from falling further into Somalia's humanitarian crisis. At this particular distribution, enough food is being handed out for 1,050 people. In September, throughout the central regions alone, this kind of targeted general food distribution assisted over 190,000 people.